Today on the show, we have Lena Yadiv, the international superstar filmmaker and the mastermind behind 2015's internationally renowned Parched, Netflix's House of Secrets, and part of the seven director of series, Tell It Like a Woman. She talks today about the balance of Hollywood and Bollywood, the collaboration she has been a part of, and how she has found her voice on the international stage. Lena shares with us the stories of her travels and the connections she makes with all the people she meets. These connections with real people are what make her films unforgettable. We think you're going to really enjoy meeting Lena and hearing her story. We obviously were connected through our good friend, Susan Cartsonis. I'd love to kind of just dive into where you started. Did you always know you wanted to be a filmmaker? And you started in editing, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. And that informed your journey or what uh, What was that like? Actually, I don't know. I was a bit lost. I wanted to be an architect. Okay. But ended up doing an honors in economics. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Like real good. <laughs> started studying for my MBA and I was like, no, no, one second, one second. This is not what I want to do. Oh my gosh. And then just went to do a diploma in media studies uh, okay. in this really lovely place called Social Communication Media in Bombay. Um, straight out of there, I knew I wanted to direct. Okay. But I, when I watched a few shoots in the director on the set, I realized that I need one skill. You know, I need to be the yeah. master of one skill. <laughs> and I don't know in complete innocence, I made the choice of editing. Okay. Um, actually, actually, I did even explore camera, but um, I tried with two cameramen who didn't take me on because they said, uh, you know, I'll give you the job, but then I don't think anybody's going to listen to you. <laughs> Oh, oh my God. So I was just like, okay, if you don't have the faith, I don't want to join you. Was that, you know, the rest of it I'll handle. Was that the industry or was that culturally? Uh, a bit of both. Okay. I mean, each yeah. pour into each other. Mm -hmm. So, um, because they weren't any and yeah. nobody just wanted to uh, put their neck out and do yeah. <laughs> something which wasn't the norm. So then uh, I learned editing. And I'm so happy because I think everything I've learned about directing comes from editing. And that's, yeah. for me, that's the final draft of the script that you read, right? <laughs> you and know, so, yeah. That's incredible. So that's how I have kind of tumbled, <laughs> was, tumbled here. Was and, having a creative career, like, you know, culturally and in your family, was that accepted? Or was it like the economics and the architecture is something more norm? How, um, how do people see the creative community? See, when I was in college that time, India was obsessed with either engineers or doctors. Mm. You know, they, they weren't much variety, but I was brought up by very, very progressive parents. My dad was in the army. Okay. So, in fact, I was a bit un-Indian in, in the way I was brought up because I was not um, religiously connected. You know, we celebrated everything in the, like everything was done by everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there was a different kind of, uh, which I missed when we come into the civil life. I mean, that's the way you demarcate it. And okay. So um, my parents never really, for, I think I got peer pressure pushed into things, if at all. It was never my parents. Oh, interesting. So in fact, even when I was doing my MBA and I was like, no, I can't do a nine to five job. I I think I want to do the, you know, study media and see yeah. what I can do. Uh, they were completely with me. And uh, and they, I, I didn't have any reference point within my family or friends who had done this. So, I mean, I just dived into it. And uh, it was a bit difficult in the first few years because it would have helped if I had some yeah. kind of... Uh, but then, you know, I kind of found my own journey. <laughs> how did you, you know, how did you break into the directing part of it from film editing? So I went into editing. Now, when I actually trace back, I think storytelling was what, in a way, brought me here. Because I think that was my survival mechanism in childhood because we were in a new city every two years. Okay. Because of the military. Yeah, the military. It, was a, it was a postable job and... Uh, so every time you made friends, you had to forget them and just <laughs> dive into. Yeah. And as children, it's not easy. They don't let you in very easily, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I think I just told fantastical stories and that's how I made friends. So, um, yeah, so I think that was what uh, kind of was the main drive. Okay. And sorry, I didn't 
answer your question. No, you did. Question. You did. No, you <laughs> no, did. You and we're we've been um, we've really been interested as we're as we're talking to all these amazing women in in the creative is um, just you know who they who they saw if they saw anyone that could be a role model and that could be in somebody that was in media or in creative for you um, that you know that you could model yourself after. And it doesn't sound like it sounds like you really had to pave your own way. I had to, and you know. Thankfully, because of the army, I didn't even have a sense of gender. <laughs> so oh. I never thought, like, if I saw great films or something, I felt I could do it. <laughs> okay. Nice. You know, the real world hit me later, very late. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, so, did, you uh, love, did you love film uh, growing I up? I did. I mean, again, you know, that's something which works subliminally. But yeah. so we watched... Um, we watched two films every week. That was the army discipline. We had beautiful open air theaters, and uh. like each army, uh, you know, posting had a beautiful theater. There was a Hollywood film and a Bollywood film. So you know, like the first films that I actually saw uh, were cowboy films. Right. <laughs> you know, that's my first right. memory, and I always wanted to make a cowboy film, but now I'm making a cowgirl. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say now you're doing cowboy. Yeah. Let's try. Oh, yeah. So, so uh, we saw. A lot of films, okay. like literally every week uh, we saw films and I think that was our window into the world and mm -hmm. uh, things. So at that stage, I never thought that, oh, this is a man's job. or I just felt like, oh, I want to do this and I'll do it. <laughs> wow. You know, okay. yeah. So I think that actually, again, is a strength that did see me through. Uh, now I'm at a point that even if there's discrimination, I don't see it. I just choose not to because, you know, at some point I had to tell myself that this is their story. This is not my, because I don't want to make that my story. That's not my story. Mm -hmm. You know, my story is that I'm an individual before being a man or woman. And I have a point of view. So, yeah. That's incredible wow. to have such agency. Or to own, you know, yes. have that in your life. <laughs> I feel like that's, you know, we're seeing a lot of people struggle with that right now. Yes. So that's incredible. That that's no, incredible. it's actually, I really feel, you know, you make your own narrative. Yeah. So what is it that becomes mm -hmm. your main narrative? Yeah. Like, you know, um, I had tough times, you know, trying to be in this industry and trying to like even figure out what I want to do, forget about survival. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, but that's not my narrative. I see a lot of filmmakers make that the narrative, but I don't know. I believe you have to make strength the narrative and there is so much strength in where everybody is today. Yeah. You know, so uh, it's it's really a simple thing in the head. And if you switch that, yeah, you know, and it's how you tell your story. What all did you win or what all did you lose? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. I can see why you and Susan are friends. I right? see I why can, you and Susan are friends. That. With with all the roles that you've played with editing and directing now, do you do you have a favorite? Do you go back and forth? Do you uh, Well, editing is the king for me. Yeah. Um, because my directing also comes from that. So I have like a lot of respect for editing and now I've learned um not now, I mean I have been learning <laughs> again and again. Uh to give that job away to someone else Is and that hard? respect that. It was hard just the first time, but uh -huh. again, it was a switch. And I realized that, you know, when I was an editor for some other director, I would ask them that, let me show you a point of view. Mm -hmm. You know, then obviously I will do what you want me to do because you're the boss. But let me at least bring something in, you know, because I'm also a part of this process. So, um... I realized that I need to do that also. You know, the, the urge is to, <laughs> to yeah. get in there. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I've surrendered to the fact that this is the most collaborative art. Mm -hmm. And if you don't justify each artist's performance, then you're killing something in the whole process. I mean, you have to be secure in the fact that you are the director and, you know, you will drive the vision, but you have to bring people into the vision, not mm -hmm. force them there. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I mean, I, that that for me is the most crucial part of the making. The editing is like, it's a make or break. We had somebody today um, that, that also directed say to us that the director's biggest job is 
to get the trust and the faith of that whole huge team. Absolutely. And that is such a that's just such an interesting you know, goal for a director to to get everybody on the same page and then that faith in your vision. Yeah. You know, this is the most like uh, vulnerable as well as the most strong part of this job is the the balance of finding that surrender and still being the boss. You know, you have to surrender to them to let them bring who they are into it. Right. You know, otherwise you are, you're not letting everything in. And then the high that you get when all these different artists with different perceptions and lives and attitudes create one moment, which is an aha for everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think anything that I can even imagine beats that. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, because everyone's bringing their personal yeah. story yeah. to their piece. And everyone, like yeah. literally each and every person from the producer down to just a boy on the set, like mm -hmm. everyone. Have you, with the different stories and the different, whether it's a comedy or musical or drama, do you feel that is it different does everyone bring them they still bring the piece no matter what the what the the genre of the I think the a story film starts is. like the script starts defining itself uh -huh. more through the windows that all these artists come yeah. into it uh -huh. um it's magical I mean it's something you have to like experience to really figure but yes every it doesn't matter it's not genre driven I think every okay. film is different because um, you know, where do you enter it from to create that same thing mm -hmm. is very, very crucial and uh, that makes all the difference. Yeah. You know, when you were looking at your projects, you know, and, and you created Parched and, you know, that it was, <coughs> it's an incredible film and it covered culturally some heavy, some heavy content, right? Yeah. Um, you know, how, how did you come to that? How did you, you know, it's, it's so different when you're looking at, like, as you said, you were watching Hollywood and Bollywood, right? Those are two vastly different kind of worlds, I would assume. Yeah. So, you know, how did you, how did you get there? Like, what was that journey like? Um, so actually, past came from a place where I was feeling really shut down. <laughs> okay. Mm. Because my first two films were, you know, they were not very Bollywood subjects but yeah. um, I made them with very big stars in India they came with their own challenges um, the economics of the film changed because of that the promotion of the film changed because of that so I just felt like I didn't reach my though I'm very proud of both those films but they they didn't belong yeah. or they didn't find that audience mm -hmm. or so um, I said you know maybe I should just stop doing this because I'm not reaching that ah yeah. that I want because I put so much in and so many years. So um, that's when my husband, who worked as a cinematographer with me on my first two films, he's like, "There's no way, you know, you're the best director I've worked with, and I'm not going to let this happen. You make you at least make one film that you're going to be the boss of. You, nothing in that film will happen without your, and you're not catering to anything, you know, in your casting, in anything." That was like the toughest promise he made me. <laughs> no, and it was no a pressure. tough journey. And that's where Pasht came from. Yeah. That I went and wrote the story. Actually, in a research trip, uh, Tanishtha Chatterjee, the yeah. act, one of the actresses, she it started with a conversation with her and said, let's make a film. We traveled and went to, you know, Gujarat and Rajasthan, had real conversations. So a lot of the conversations and characters in Pasht but for me, the biggest thing was that I came back to Bombay and I started writing this. And this is one of the fastest scripts I've written. Really? <laughs> because it came from a real like yeah. space. Yeah. Did you write the but, first two films also? Yes. Okay. So my aha was that this is, I'm not telling their story. I'm telling my story. Mm. Yeah. You know, the ownership of that because, and then that became a major theme in everything that I do, that mm -hmm. you can't do things with judgment. You know, so first, mm -hmm. the moment you need to acknowledge that it's you, it's not them. Because if you tell it for them, then it's about, you know, that problem. It's not your problem. Because honestly, exactly the same things were happening around me in Bombay, but it was just more disguised. Yeah. And then I said, oh my God, this is crazy. 
so a film rooted in this village which has no education for the women it has no info it doesn't even have a tv um you know does that have resonance worldwide and then i sent my script to filmmaker friends across the world and uh, they wrote back with more stories yeah you know then i said this is wow but this is so shit so what is progress right you we've just so then i realized that the 90s just taught us to say the right things to be politically correct that didn't change the inside no it didn't you know so i said okay i have to make this film and this is my experiment yeah. that something which is so rooted uh so and the reactions were very similar it did come from mm, your problem yeah poor india so many rapes happening there you know oh child marriage still happens in india especially in america that was the conversation starter in the q and a's and then i would say but do you know domestic violence is the highest in america or you know this is child marriage what about child uh, you know teenage pregnancies yeah right and that would completely turn the conversation the moment you let the problem in that's when you'll really realize that and you know today after covid i'm sorry but the world cannot afford to say it's their problem right no it's right. everybody's problem it's everybody if it's happening in one part of the world as humanity we are all responsible and we are all right you know it's it's interesting cuz you know one of the both gretchen and i for years um we we worked with and we were very close to women in the world and Tina Brown always had her big conference and it always amazed me going there because the amount that of of exposure and light on women's issues everywhere in the world you know i i, I hate to say that we have it so lucky here that we don't have to deal like we yes there are definite issues but to the level that girls and women around the world what they face and what yeah. they're fighting for from an education standpoint exposure standpoint safety safety Help. it's it's mind blowing yeah. yes it is and we need you know films like this and and people to advocate you know to, and and to shine a light on that it's it's unbelievable it is it is you know and it's it's almost like we've lost the plot <laughs> completely we've you know and the no, world's and this, lost the this plot is just we've actually as humanity been through a collective experience of fear of helplessness of loss yeah today we cannot say it's their problem yeah. no it's not because we would have said the same thing with covid you know yeah oh that poor country it's suffering there in the corner yeah. you know 100%. but we all went through it and we all saw a lot of reality yeah we had to we there was no option It's like I think what what's scary is what we didn't see, right? It's it's what did we not see in the smaller villages that don't have televisions, you know, yeah. that don't yeah. have any sort of media or ex yeah. exposure to the outside world. And I think that's something that content But I think we felt it. Like oh, I think oh, this was yeah. a very different time. It was it was collective for the first time in the world. Yeah, it was the know? same time, the same it was, uh, yeah, with everyone experiencing. And I don't think we've still processed it. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. uh recently i was just telling somebody that everything is feeling a bit dystopian i don't know i cannot define it but it, it is i know it's it wild. is it's, it's it's the way people are reacting to things uh the decision making they priority i just know there is something off but i don't know what <laughs> there's you know it's we were we were, we've we've been talking about it a little bit today and gretchen we're talking about it but i feel like when i look back on 2020 and 2021 You were waiting for months to go by to get back to normal and now we're back to, and I look back and I'm like wow it feels like a blink of an eye but there's so many cultural shifts and habits and you know there's so much you know information misinformation there's just so much that hasn't been processed that I'll be curious to see where the world is in 10 years when we look back on it because I think it needs time in order to yeah. heal for everybody to have hindsight on it yeah yeah you know and, and that's the recovery pace is so different for different places yeah and whether even in our own country i mean looking at how the middle of america you know smaller cities recovered so much faster than than even los angeles you know what what los angeles is still going through and recovering but it is it's an interesting perspective to think of the first time that 
the world went through yeah. the same thing at the same time and we had visibility into it immediately. Yeah. Yeah. And social media had a big role yeah. in that. Like if Absolutely. you think about growing up, yeah. we would have no idea what was going on in the world. No, we exactly. Kids, because exactly. it was like we had three. Networks. I mean, the good and the bad. We had lots yeah. of right. conspiracy theories driving people nuts. Yeah. But, mm. 100%. <laughs> but it was all part of how you process fear and yeah. survival and death. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, going back to your story, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, going from, you know, parched and then you did House of Secrets. Yes. How did you get to, you know, that's, it's kind of a fascinating story, a true yeah. crime. Um, you know, how did, you know, you've kind of, your, your genres are, <laughs> you're kind of changing, changing and yes, doc, going into action. docs. And, auto. You ha and now you're going to go to, you know, <laughs> Cowgirl's Last Ride with yes. Gina and yes. it's, you know, you know, talk about, let's talk about your journey of how you're getting to these projects and what's attracting you to them. And so parched, so d did that for me that it kind yeah. of told me that, no, you will have an audience, you know, mm -hmm. wherever it is, um, you, you have to find it. And it just like opened that kind of horizon. And I met some amazing uh, filmmakers like Susan and yeah. started collaborating with them. So uh, around that time, so actually in 2018, when this case had happened in Delhi Burari, where 11 people were found hanging in their house, um, it was devastating. And I think uh, the whole country was like, what yeah, like happened what here? Happened here? Um, and then very soon it went into all kinds of mumbo jumbo coverage, you know, like just tantra mantra. And, you know, it just became like this mystical thing and then just fell off the map. Nobody knows what happened and nobody tried to find out what happened. Yeah. And I was like, what the hell did there is? So obviously there was something uncomfortable there that people did not explore. I mean, this is a case that should have had write-ups by like, you know, uh, academic pieces by yeah. journal senior journalists. It should have been covered. I mean, this should have been studied by psychologists. It was a very, very unique case, but nothing happened. Yeah. So in 2019, the international team of Netflix was coming to India. We didn't then have a, no, uh, you know, nonfiction yeah. department. And somebody from Netflix called me and said, do you have something? Do you want to pitch something? They're coming here. I was like, yes. And this was the only thing, you know, uh, that I had said that if I get yeah. to investigate this, I would love to. So I pitched this to them. They loved it. And they said, okay, you know, let's do this. So... That's how it happened. And then I was just like, why did I bring this into my life? <laughs> <laughs> you know, why, am I, what you for. Yeah, you... why am I dealing with something so dark? Like, yeah. you know, because yeah. it was it was really dark even just getting in. Yeah. So then uh, we just reached Delhi and I said, you know, nobody's going to talk to me because it's so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So nobody's going to talk. So there's no documentary. <laughs> So I said, okay, let me see. Let me go to the cops. Yeah. Um, and I went to meet the commissioner of police, who was just amazing. In the first go, he gave me permission that I can, you know. I said, oh, God, I do have a documentary now. <laughs> <laughs> so the opposite then happened. <laughs> yes. And then we dived into it. And it was it was a crazy emotional mind wrecking, heart wrecking, gut wrecking journey. Yeah. To just like even having those conversations was not easy. You know, like I mean, I, I, as a filmmaker, I went through a lot of uh, yeah. introspection in terms of. Uh, so I'm going to go to somebody and say, "Oh, I know, you know, there's a painful part. Can I scratch it a little more?" Well, it's it's, <laughs> you know? it's dealing with real, you know, it's real yeah. world. It's real. It's, but it's, you know, beautifully. And this happened in past, like the film came in, you know, life came into the film. Yeah. It was not a script that we made, you know, it it went into life and it brought life back in. Mm -hmm. yeah. So similarly in House of Secrets, it just took its own course, um, the journey that we all had. And I remember midway through doing the interviews, especially when I was really disturbed dealing with the fam friends and family and dealing with myself of... Like, why am I having this conversation? And then, you know, for content, there's also a conscious part that tries to push the envelope somewhere. Yeah. Um, but I remember one of the relatives, after the interview, he came and said, thank you for doing this. He said, we haven't had this conversation even amongst ourselves. 
That's amazing. So, you know, this was very therapeutic. Just to be able to yes. say, maybe this happened, maybe this happened. Or just, you know, whatever what sure, are so theories or doubts. Or, he says, we just came back and yeah. nobody spoke about it because it was so uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, so that whole theme of the fact is we don't talk about things which are uncomfortable. Uh, in this family, um, there was a trauma that they were dealing with in one of the characters and they just didn't, like the mother told, in good intention told the friends, never discuss that, you know. Yeah. And that's what we do as human beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, he had a trauma, let's not talk about it. What if he really wants to talk about it? Right. It's part of the healing process. Yeah. Oh, grief, you know, leave them alone. Maybe they don't want to be left alone. You know, so it's so many things we tackle it from our own perspective. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing about mental health, it's so, it's, the problem is so ingrained in every family struck, in every life. Mm -hmm. And nobody talks about it. And something like this happened, 11 people just died, you know, because of just poor mental health of one person that just went, uh, you know, uh, worse and worse over the years. So the thing is, again, this could not have been their story. They're not these, you know, uh, kind of people. They were, they were leading social life. Nobody could tell that is not okay. Right. Yeah. You know, it was not in isolation. A cult was, uh, you know, happening. This was in public life. Yeah. But again, when we see, oh, don't, don't leave it alone. Leave it alone. Yeah. You know? Or just as a family, always projecting the best face forward. Mm hmm. I often say that for me, the best part about growing up was having real conversations and I realized everybody's life was equally fucked up as mine. <laughs> you know, because otherwise you just yeah, think, yeah. You think it's all happening to me. Oh my God, they're all such happy people. Right. These are the yeah. perfect families. What about my family? Right. You know? Those so, are messages we we still, I mean, we have to talk about even more and more, especially with social media. I mean, don't get us yeah. started on having to, you know, talk to your own children or talk to your family about this is not, this is the finished product. Yeah. This is not the everyday, all day, what's happening in the lives. Yeah. Um, but I think it's such an interesting perspective to say, how you don't know, like maybe they do want to talk about it. Yeah. Maybe they do want to. Yeah, how you know, do we hear, decide that? Yeah. We are uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. Having right. that conversation. It's not it's not them, you know. I I have experienced this so many times. You go and ask somebody and uncom and they say, Thank you for asking me. Yeah. Yeah. I know everybody wants to, but nobody is, and that's creating this crazy negative energy around me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so just having real, you know, I mean, like we've unlearned all our basic instincts. That's not something we need to learn or consciously yeah. do today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that was our instinct to reach out. Today, even touch has become like mm, question mark. Yeah. Should I, shouldn't I? But please believe it. You give anybody a hug, they're never going to curse you for it. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. How, you know, you know, as you're looking forward, how are you looking at projects? Like, how did you get to Cowgirls Last Ride that's coming up with Gina? Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> like how did I you told you, that's one of my childhood dreams coming. Is, like, so, is doing. Yeah. So, and it's such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful film. And just the idea of working with Gina. Yeah. Uh, I think I've been working my way towards Gina because uh, at the Palm Springs Festival, one of the reviews headline was uh, for Parched. Uh, a Thelma and Louise from India or something like yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> then on my film after Pash Rajma Chawal, I worked with this amazing editor called Tom Noble who had edited uh, Thelma and Louise. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. Yes, and now it's all I get to, yes, the cowgirl. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, Things are all pointing that way. Everything's <laughs> pointing that way. Um, when, in terms of, you know, when you were growing up, you obviously kind of carved your own path. How how do you look at mentorship now, and how do you look at that exposure? You know, have it, you've you had to go out there and create your own network. You know, now what does that look like from a collaboration standpoint or mentorship? How has that shifted? Uh, I've made my own network, but I don't know whether I have my own network. <laughs> For me, yeah. it's like everything is the beginning all over again. You know? Oh, really? And really, it is. I mean, uh, when people used to tell me just your first film is tough, after that it gets, it's not. I think there's so many more filters that come in after every time you make a film. 
and so much cleaning up you have to do, you know, because either you build in like self censorship on certain things, or you've bought into something that oh people want this or like this yeah. or etc. Mm-hmm. Just to keep going back to the basic and like trying to make your first film over and over again, for me, I mean that's that's the journey of uh, of my growth that I will yeah. have to keep going back to zero and. Just learning it and relearning it, like even just doing this documentary completely, like changed my perspective on narrative. Mm. So I think each experience takes you few steps forward, but then you know you want to come back because you don't want to carry a load on anything. Yeah, <laughs> you know from any previous uh, thing. So that's why I mean I'm not stuck to any genre. Yeah, um, I want to tell stories, and I honestly want to experiment with every genre possible. Okay. What about the teams that you? And I didn't again answer your question. <laughs> oh, I did. No, you did. You did. You did. You did. <laughs> um, what about the teams that you put together on these projects? Do you work? Do you tend? Do you work with the same people? Do they travel around? Or are you looking? I've at loved really different- almost everybody I've worked with, honestly. And uh-huh. uh, for me, the shooting experience of each film that I've done till date has been just outstanding. And mm-hmm. I think that's been my strength more than anything else, and taken me forward with strength. Um, I would like to repeat everybody, but they are all great people. <laughs> I don't necessarily get to yeah. work with uh-huh. people, but one of my big learnings, which came from actually uh, Teen Patti before Parch, when I worked with an editor from here, is just to broaden your storytelling, involve more voices. Mm-hmm. I I'm not in agreement with you have to tell your story. Yeah, that's not what I came into filmmaking for. You know, I've lived my story. I've seen it in too much color and light. I don't want another lens on it, at least not from me. Yeah. You know, so I want to tell other stories. So I get to learn and experience and actually get in. But when you make a film, you are in, you know, yeah. in every way possible to a culture, to a um, geography, to anything. So I want to make films all over the world. I want to tell everybody's stories. Yeah. <laughs> and I want us to be, like my dream would be to have literally a technician from every country on a set. That's amazing. To tell the it's same story. Because the right. stories, if they are rooted, they are universal. You know? Yeah. And they speak. if you tell a basic emotional truth, that's the same for all of us. Yeah. Right, right. So, yes, that's my dream. <laughs> That's an incredible that aspiration. I co- so, and I always do try to collaborate with people that I have like admired, and and I've had some amazing opportunities yeah. to do that. So, yeah. With Tell It Like a Woman, when you have seven different directors, what was that like? So it was really interesting. This project came to me during the lockdown. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a project that's been going on since a while, and uh, it is. A special child, so it's tough to make. So <laughs> it took some time, and then uh, around 2020, Carol Polakoff, uh, the executive producer of the film, called me and said that, you know, do you think you can do a film because we've had some changes? And so that's how it happened. And uh, she said, can you shoot in India right now? So this was 2020, the first year of the lockdown, and this was around yeah June, July. I sent them a script. Finally, I shot it in November, which we were still under curfew in and out of lockdowns. So it was actually very special because that lockdown did a lot of things to me. Yeah. (laughs) A lot of introspection, lots of analysis. And I was actually just thinking, I wish I get to record this time in a work. You know, and that's when... uh, so there's an organization called We Do It Together run by Chiara Tilesi. Uh, she, uh, you know, started this whole project and uh, she's quite a woman who, you know, brought it to this level, which is amazing. And yeah, so we got to shoot this film and uh, it's very special because uh, because I was doing short format for the first... Again, see, even just a format gets me so excited that... <laughs> That I have to use a different narrative, you know. I felt yeah. like I, it's not like a condensed feature. It has to be something else. So I said, okay, I'm going to have minimum dialogue. And I'm going to go into a little bit of abstraction to be able to tell a longer story in a shorter time. So I did that and uh, it was really fun shooting this film. Yeah, That's amazing. Yeah. 
it gave me that hope in between the lockdown that <laughs> we will come back someday. <laughs> What was it like, you know, what is, what is the, you know, what is the Hollywood scene like right now in India right now? It's always been, I mean, Hollywood has had a great presence in India. Yeah. Yeah. With Bollywood and. Yes. Yes. Even from Frank Capra times. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, we saw all the Clint Eastwood films. So uh, Hollywood is big and. Like, I think even our films now, Hollywood, Bollywood is all going to become one. I mean, I find a lot of Hollywood films which are very Bollywood yeah, in sensibility right, right. now. Uh, and yeah, I think because of all the platforms, we've also started watching a lot of content. Yeah. So there is a lot of more awareness of different cultures and different ways of... And I think we are borrowing, stealing, inspiring each other. <laughs> I was on a Bollywood set when I was 22 years old. Why? A really? Friend of, yeah. My, a friend of mine, and it was it was a different time, so you're talking 20 years ago. Me, I went over to India. One of my friends um, is from Mumbai. He uh, and he was like, "Oh, come over for the holidays. Like, we'll just do a trip." And it was me and three guys. Oh, I remember. <laughs> Which, by the way, at that time in early two thousand, was, was an scandalous. Un- <laughs> it was very scandalous, <laughs> and they were spelling my name my name on all of my tickets because they kept spelling it wrong. Didn't match my passport on top of it. It was they spelt it R E N A E versus R E N E E, so it didn't match my passport at the time. Oh my god! So I was traveling, and everywhere we went, because we went to Delhi, Mumbai, Goa, but and we were invited because. Um, do you have you heard of Hokey Pokey ice cream? Yes. Yeah, my friend is was the founder. Oh, so okay. Ro, okay. <laughs> Ro was like, "Oh, come on, we're gonna go to this Bollywood set," and I was like, "Okay," and we went, and I was like. It was just so much, it was, it was just the most colorful thing I've ever been to in my life. And it was just like lots of sparkle. <laughs> and it yeah. was so much fun. You wouldn't fun. remember the name, would you? I would not at that time because I was just, wow. I, I didn't, I didn't and know. And were they shooting a dance? Or they, they were, were sh- they were shooting, we were on a beach. Oh, okay. So it was, but it was, it was incredible. But wow. yes, my one time in India was a week and a half and it was, it was wild. So it I was, have to come back. Yeah, I shoot on like my especially oh, 20, yes. 20, 20, 25 years later, it's yeah. like it's, um, no, it's like a completely different to. world right now. So, yeah. the um, are you? How are you feeling about all of the notice now that that you know the Asian community that the Indian films are all getting even in you know for the awards is that is that important? Is that there's so much it's representation long overdue. again? Like I said, now yeah. it's not yours and mine. It has yeah. to be ours, Us, right? Yeah. But it's, you it, know, so uh, I'm. Hoping that this continues and becomes bigger and more integrated. Mm -hmm. Um, Because a lot of times inclusion looks like inclusion and uh, that's not the way one wants it to be. Like, I don't want a job just because I'm a woman. Yeah, right. Ideally, because I feel on merit, I can get it. So, yeah, I hope it increases. It's a great step in the right direction. Right, right. (laughs) Yeah. So when you're looking at Cowgirl's Last Ride, what was yes. your favorite Western growing up that you watched? Like what was, you obviously wanted to do a cowboy movie, but what was it, what was, what were the ones that resonated with you that you remember from when you were younger? On yes, Good, Bad, Ugly. Um, okay. The Seven. Okay. The Seven Samurai. The Magnificent no. Seven. Magnific- the Mag- yeah. Yeah, Magnificent yeah. Seven, yeah. which later okay. on came from Seven Samurai, I think. Yes. 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 It did come from Seven Samurai. And uh, yeah, those are films that I'm, I remember a lot of Alfred Hitchcock black yeah. and white I mm-hmm. wish I get to do a film in black and white because my first like memories of yeah. cinema are black and white and they had so much color <laughs> I'm like it's funny I sat down I made so much my texture. Um, I made my stepdaughter watch Roman Holiday the other day oh, and I was so just good. like oh. I was like yeah. Yes. Trying to bring, she's like, why? Where's the color? <laughs> yeah. What happened to the television? Like, <laughs> <laughs> there was Got once through. a time. <laughs> and Lena, what do you, what do you, what do you like watching now? What are you, uh, are you, are you a streamer? Do you watch television? Are you all cinematic no. movies? Uh, a bit of everything. I'm not much of a watcher. I get uh-huh. tired. I get a lot of fatigue uh, from uh-huh. watching. Uh-huh. I don't, I like even binging. Like, I, I don't, I, I feel like I'm so behind everybody <laughs> in watching stuff. Yeah. But uh, I'm stuck to the older pace of let things sit with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. 
So there is nothing. I mean, whatever gets me, I get into it. Okay. But I have not seen anything beyond two or three seasons, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. In terms of so one of the things that we are launching is a we don't like to say that it's a book club. Not a book club, it's, it's a book, book nook. It's a book nook. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, and one of and what we're trying to kind of get is like a fun book list. Are you reading anything? Are you a, are you a reader? Are you are there books that have influenced you over Now I mostly read for for I read a lot <laughs> for work, but I'm reading <laughs> scripts which I like yeah. books for yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> uh what last what did I read? It is it is something that I'm working on right yeah. now, but uh, okay. a memoir called A Fractured Life. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's written by Shabnam Samuel, who lives now in DC. Um, yeah. So I'm working on something with her about her life, uh, okay. which is the book. And off that book. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Have you worked off of novels before? Uh, not really, but this doesn't even feel like it's a novel because she's there and it's just it's like, a, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's a lot of responsibility. It's, um, it's, it's huge. Um, yeah. And, uh, a part of my documentary learning comes in mm -hmm. handy in the responsibility, mm -hmm. you know, creating yeah. content out of reality is, comes with, yeah. Okay. With all of your growing up with a military family and all of your travels, do you have favorite places that you've that you've lived or that you want to? Do you have? I I love traveling. I um, I've traveled a lot, uh -huh. and I will continue. I mean, just within India, I I don't know how long it's going to take me to finish. You'll right. I'll never be able to finish. <laughs> <laughs> but just within India, there's so many places. Yeah. But I like going to like unknown places. So I. I have a wish list, but most of it is done. <laughs> but I like surprises. I I want to go to like anywhere. <laughs> Do you have a favorite place that you've already visited? Just meeting new people, yeah. learning yeah. of new lives, yeah. uh, being surprised by new kind of food. <laughs> 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 and then still wanting my Indian food fix once a week at least. <laughs> <laughs> Do, Do other countries have good Indian food? LA doesn't. LA does not. UK London. does. Does London? London yes. does. Yes, I yeah. really yeah, London has. New York good. has. Um, yeah. LA, very, very little, very little, unfortunately. But it's more that the food has been, you know, kind of modified for a Western. Right, place. right. So I, yeah, I miss yeah. the real food. I don't think Winnipeg is going to uh, no, fulfill that for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll have a lot of fish. <laughs> All true. <laughs> Oh, I love fish, so that's Okay, great. I think. I, I love that. Well, thank you, Lena, for being here thank with you us. So much. It has been thank so you. nice to meet you. Yeah, and, and we. The time has flown. I know. We, uh, we thank Susan for yeah. so many things every week. Now we have something new to yeah. thank her for. Is say, introducing. Don't worry, I'm also thanking all the time. Uh, yeah, she. <laughs> but she is, she's the magical angel. <laughs> she is. She is. She yes. absolutely is. She's yeah. so She's so lovely and amazing. So. Yeah. And she introduces us to the most amazing people. Yeah. So we'll have wow. to thank her for you now. Yeah. Next. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe and leave a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. To stay up to date with In Her Words, join the conversation by following Women in Entertainment on our social channels and subscribe to our weekly newsletter at womenandentertainment.com.